All right, right. Trip. You see our next guest here. I messaged you the Twitter handle of Mr. John Contable. If I am, I have opened. Oh, whoops. Opens. Yeah, I have opened seats. So all you have to do, John, is click like on the screen the request to join thing. There you go. Perfect. Dun dun dun. Now you know it's fun uh, about this mic is um, I'm going to have a conversational. uh, what do you call it when like your balance gets thrown off because of your ear? Mm-hmm. You know, Wait, like, what? you know, what's it called when your ear and then your balance gets off? Like equilibrium, like uh, disequilibrium. Yeah, whatever it was. Anyway, just saying, like it's fun jumping into like the parts of the book. People from completely different spectrums. Vertigo. Yes, exactly. Ah, right. It's theological vertigo. Or you're like, you wrote this book and then this book is this other thing that then provokes a conversation between two people that are in very different locations. I have uh, anyway, sorry. Hi, John. Hey, Drew. <laughs> John, welcome. John is a minister and regional servant leader for the Progressive Christian Alliance. He's a homebrew deacon and all around Theo rogue from Claremont, California. Uh oh. Hey, guys, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very we sure good. can. Hey, Drew, how yes. are you doing? I, I'm I'm doing good. When are you guys gonna do another event out at Dale Brothers? Ooh, that is a really good a really good question. Um, I I think you should tell uh, Philip to make it happen because we do stuff quite regularly. So all we have to do is uh, decide in advance to do it at Dale Brothers. And if you've never been to Claremont, um, when you go, there's a number of craft breweries in town. Dale Brothers is my favorite because. Uh, I love lagers done well, and they brew tons of European style lagers, and they're good. Not like they called it a European lager, and they clearly didn't control fermentation, and it tastes like apple and cardboard. So that's my Dell Brothers plug. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Uh, Are y'all like local to each other? What was that? Are y'all local to each other? I, my California geography is terrible. You're in Claremont, so is that near you, Trip? It's like an hour and a half. To, to two depending on traffic but it's you know i was there a lot for my phd yep right awesome well Well, john what do you want to talk about with uh the old homebrew jesus guide here thanks mike um i thought you did a great job chip it was a really good really good read um you know it's it's spent a lot of time uh explaining things and also taking people deeper so i I thought it's a good start to the homebrew series um that said I'm curious because I know Jack Caputo has said uh, when he talks about radical theology that uh, Jesus and the Father have gotten too much airtime uh, since the Reformation, and it's the age of the Spirit. Would you disagree or, or disagree, or what are your comments on that? Yeah, yeah, um, and um, I'm sure at some point we've argued about it, but he and I will see each other next week, and we're actually doing a entire day-long thing on the trajectory of God understood philosophically through uh, the history of the church. And this will probably be the primary point of argument. Uh, Though settling it now beforehand without him here is a lot easier than uh, with him because um, to me that that's like uh, getting in the ring with a professional MMA fighter. Yeah. Um, But I I would put it this way that um, if the dialectic, and this is, you know, if you're doing a radical theologian kind of uh, use of the dialectic, then um, you end up giving a rather modalist account of the ultimate's relationship to history. And through the death of the son, you have the recognition of the absence of the father, but also um, you have uh, what was ultimate located in material existence on the eminent plane, and that's uh, the spirit. Uh, that to me is a very modalist understanding of the Trinity, you know, where God kind of shifts these modes and what shifting modes isn't then when she realized there is no big other God shifting modes. It's uh, the um, power or function of, of the big other in human, uh, human concepts. Um, and so like in the book, my argument more is that uh, the dialectic Become, takes a cruciform shape in in Christ. That the dialectic is um, is, is a Christocentric one, and but you know that if you there are plenty of theologians who would agree with me 
and then develop rather robust pneumatologies, doctrines of the spirit. Um, like Elizabeth Johnson does it, Jürgen Moltmann does it, um, Hahnenberg does it, uh, Joseph Bracken, process thinker, does it, uh, where um, the, the it's just you're asking a very different question when the movement of God in history to the cross is, uh, is it answered by um, kind of the rejection and letting go of particular kind of clarity crystallizing of different concepts of God? Or does this, the event of the cross unveil the relationships of the persons of the Trinity? Um, and that's the one, I, that's the one I'm arguing for. I actually think it's a rather radical thing to argue for. It's not like it's a normal thing in, Christ, in the, the church history. Uh, but it is a way of uh, developing kind of a uh, Trinitarian thought that is engaging in a lot of the same conversations. Um, yeah, I don't – maybe say something else, and then I'll know if yeah. I was even answering the correct question. No, no, I just want to throw that out there because I thought that was really profound it was on one of the uh, previous uh, homebrew podcasts. Did, you, really did you get that. the paragraph I wrote for uh, – I don't have to find it. But I wrote, you know, I wrote him and Pete a whole paragraph. Where I critique their whole specter thing, um, I don't have to. I bet yeah, if I pull, you know, I, and in it, basically, I'm saying like the haunting isn't like Jesus haunts our understandings of God. It's the other way around. That the cross actually haunts um, our theology without God's eschatological commitment, because uh, Jesus stands in and protests our theologies that do not insist upon God uh, standing with and for and giving hope to marginalize the oppressed and the crucified. Um, the uh, haunting of the cross, the cross gives us nightmares that are blessings. It forces us to look at the crucified in our own world and, and stare them in the face. And um, the cross, the resurrection forces us to see God's own identity is invested in the transformation and redemption of the outcast, downtrodden, oppressed, and the victims. Um, the haunting of theology to me is a theology in which uh, God does not end up being the God who Jesus said uh, God was. Um, the, the identity of God's up for grabs, not the reality of God. Um, eschatological thought shifts it, where the essence of God, is God loving, is pointed so hard in light of evil that it becomes a question of the existence of God, the reality of God. But the answer coming out of the cross is a reality that the essence of God is the one is in the very heart of God is the death of the son. And then Christ becomes the brother of all the crucified and the experience of the father's experience of grief and loss. So, um, those two, that dynamic is kind of the opening out point for addressing similar questions. Great. Uh, I got, do I have time for one more question, Mike? You sure do. Go for it. Um, you know, two of my favorite uh, quotes from you, Trip, are, you know, that God should be at least as nice as Jesus, and also that um, the way of the church became the way of empire. Mm hmm what are some of the biggest reasons that the kingdom of God has become empire for so many Christians? Well, I, I mean, I think the reason is actually the reason um, uh, that it took, in a sense, a confrontation as big as the cross to make things clear. Uh, well, one, uh, one way, and I kind of talk about it in the book, uh, is that when we read the temptation stories of Jesus, those temptation stories are about the identity of the Messiah. What kind of Messiah is Jesus going to be? And the temptations, like, you want to turn all the rocks into bread because, you know, you're hungry. Everyone around here is hungry. You feed everybody. You'll have an answer to the question. Do you want to jump off the top of the mount? Angels will grab you. You'll float down and people will be like, oh, junk. This guy's powerful. Now, clearly, this must be the Christ. Oh, in fact, you know, if you just worship the Savior. Uh, then... I'll put you in charge. Look at the, you would be the most loving Caesar ever, Jesus. Yeah. And in the rejection of those is a rejection that clarifies his vocation. And in the same way, I think the church is always has those ever present temptations. Is the church's vocation simply to meet people's physical needs like bread? 
No, but it includes it because we don't live by just bread alone. It is the temptation for the church to have a power that compels belief through these radical wonders, demonstrations? No, but do beautiful and magical and mystical encounters happen? Yes, they do, but that's not what persuades us in what shapes the community. Do we want to get in bed with the rulers of the age and have, well, yep, that's kind of what happened. Uh, and so to me, that those temptations that we see the church has given into aren't foreign. And in fact, when Jesus was engaging them, he was engaging in a quest for identity. And the church constantly has to ask that question. So part of the emphasis on the unique shape of Jesus's own historical ministry, understanding of the kingdom of God and such uh, in the book is so that the church itself comes to let Jesus's own self-understanding of his mission and things frame our own understanding of mission. Uh, and the question that shapes it for Jesus is involved in relationship to empire and that kind of thing. Um, but we shouldn't be surprised the temptation's real. It was real for Jesus. And Very true. Well, thanks, John, for these questions. It's been great. It's been we have great. a deacon on here.